role or the, or the, of the Kenyan and uh, Ethiopian governments. And I hope particularly that the Kenyan government uh, ensures that Somalis who seek refuge in Kenya are not prevented from doing so. And I'd be interested to know if the Foreign Secretary is making representations to the Kenyan government on that matter. Uh, and a, a sort of final point, or as I draw to my sort of concluding remarks, uh, I, I want to pick up on the, some of the comments made by the Honourable Member for Cheltenham and indeed my Honourable Friend, who is now not in a place from Bethnal Green and Bow, uh, about uh, economic development and building resilience in Somalia. I think this has to be an absolutely central objective of the international uh, community. Uh, Oxfam and Save the Children, we know, warn that the world did not act fast enough to respond to the crisis, although I do pay tribute to the work that DFID did. Uh, even though we knew the warning signals were there, we knew the rains were fought, had failed, we knew that commodity prices were escalating, and we all know of the lethal consequences of the political instability in that part of the world. But instead of uh, just reacting when it's too late, as we try to build political uh, stability in that country, I think we have to do more to address the underlying issues. And we have to do more to support investment in local food production, investment in sustainable livestock production and agriculture. And I hope the conference also considers climate change. In the conversation about climate change, we don't always think of uh, Somalia and the Horn of Africa. There's other parts of the world which perhaps take more of our attention. Uh, but I think there is some emerging scientific thinking which uh, suggests that not only uh, we know the reasons for why the short range for, failed, but there's emerging sci scientific thinking which suggests that the long range failed and will continue to fail as a result of climate change. Now, I think this is something that we need to look at and discuss, and I hope there's a chance for the conference to start, to start having deli deliberations on this issue, because if it is the case that climate change is also affecting that part of the world and affecting the long range in that part of the world, then we will need to do more uh, to invest in better irrigation systems and have a strategy for dealing with it. And finally, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I represent a significant Somali community in Leicester, uh, a community that has settled in Leicester from all over uh, Somalia and Somaliland. Uh, some members of the community there call, like to refer them to themselves as mini Somalia. There is much expertise and good sense taught by many of those in the Leicester Somali community. Many of them attended the conference yesterday. The Somali community in Leicester recently raised funds and will be sending an ambulance to Mogadishu uh, in the next few weeks. The Somali community in Leicester tell me they want this conference to succeed, but wearily they have seen too many conferences and too many initiatives fail in the past. Uh, they want the international community to do what it can to help foster a solution, but they are well aware that a solution has to be a Somali-led solution. But crucially, they want the Foreign Office to continue to engage with them not just up in the run-up to this conference, like the very uh, successful event yesterday, but beyond as well. And I'm sure I uh, speak for many in the Somali community on the St Matthews estate in my constituency, where now, if I could take this opportunity, perhaps, to indeed invite the Foreign Secretary or the Development Secretary, or indeed the uh, African Minister currently on the, on the Treasury bench, to come to the St Matthews estate in Leicester. He would get some very good coffee some very fine food, and I think it would be a very good signal uh, of the way in which the Foreign Office, or, or DFID perhaps, is engaging the Somali community in Leicester. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Edward Lee. So we have the uh, Honourable Member for Leicester to thank this debate. We're very grateful to him. Or perhaps we have the uh, lack of business that is coming back from the other place to here. I think sometimes we're too self-absorbed, and it's quite good that actually we've got uh, a few weeks in which we can look beyond our own horizons and think about what is happening elsewhere in the world where often there is very great suffering. And I warmly welcome uh, what my honourable friend, the African Minister, has achieved and the Foreign Secretary for their proactive stance on Somalia. It's clear that we have a Foreign Secretary of stature, but of course we knew that already. And we have a Minister for Africa who's really trying to push this process forward. He said recently, and I'm quoting him, that he wanted a strategic approach. Uh, but Somalia, of course, defies strategy. And liberal uh, nostrums of liberal 
uh, unitary democracy. It doesn't work with Somalia. There are tinges there, shades, gradations, distinctions that evade a simple solution. And I think we've got to learn to work with this reality rather than try to defeat it with our own notions of what is right. Uh, we cannot. Of course I give way to the right on gentleman. I'm, I'm gr grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way, uh, but I don't think we should be quite so defeatist, given that the Somalis have a model themselves that has worked uh, in Somaliland, dealing with uh, what was a clan situation, dealing with uh, engagement of the elders so th through the uh, Gurti. Um, so I think he's right about the current situation, uh, but I don't think we should write off the capacity of Somalis uh, to build democracy uh, if, especially if they can do that with our help. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that entirely, and I apologise if I was just trying in my opening remarks to sort of give a rather defeatist uh, tone. I didn't mean to do that at all. I just wanted to be realistic, and I will, as many have already dealt with Somaliland, pay tribute to what's been achieved there. And there is a model, and the right honourable gentleman speaks with great knowledge about it, my honourable friend for Banbury, and therefore we, we, should, we shouldn't actually uh, despair of the situation. What I was trying to lead to, and I hope that my, the right honourable friend will agree with this, that there is no single solution or governmental process that is right, because Somalia is a patchwork of sub-national entities, and some are large, like Somaliland, some small, some clan-based. Uh, now, Somaliland, of course, has developed governmental structures that exercise authority, in a relatively normal and competent way. And they've done that actually despite, or dare I say it, perhaps because almost total non-recognition by outside powers, and perhaps we should learn something from that. But elsewhere, of course, in Somalia, power can shift rapidly as clans align, separate and shift alliances. Now, I suspect that progress can only be made by encouraging the peaceful institutionalization and regularization of these clan structures. And this isn't being defeated, it's just recognizing reality. And that's why I believe that any kind of imposed solution or attempt to create an imposed solution out of this conference would be a mistake. Yeah, yeah. At least, in my view, we have learned some lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan. I strongly opposed both those ventures because I believe they were badly planned and they involved Western troops on the ground. Thank God we've learnt the lessons and British coffins are not returning through Wooten Bassett from Somalia. But we are actually engaged and not a great deal has been said about this so far. <coughs> We are apparently training, equipping, supporting Kenyan and Af other African uh, Union troops. And I'm told that you can often see British Army officers in Nairobi doing this. Not a great deal is disclosed about this by our government. Perhaps that's right. Perhaps this should be uh, under the radar. But I do think also that Parliament actually who pays for all this does need to know what is happening on behalf of our taxpayer. But I think we've got to acknowledge the limitations of foreign intervention, even if we're being cleverer this time about it and using troops from the African Union as effectively prox proxies. Just because troops are from Burundi and Kenya does not mean that they are not resented as interloping Christians and foreigners by many in Somalia, and we have to recognise that. And we mustn't be over-optimistic about their ability to change events there. And I still believe that there are worrying comparisons with Afghanistan. For a start, foreign intervention. A, secondly, a resurgent Muslim, Al-Shabaab, read Taliban in Afghanistan. A weak, corrupt central government. And I think uh, in this debate we've been too kind on the Mogadishu government, too reliant on aid from the West, truth to tell, and it might be difficult for the Foreign Secretary to say this, and I went to the Somali conference yesterday in Chatham House, 
and he gave an excellent speech, but it may be difficult for him to say this, but truth to tell, the failure of the transitional federal charter and the transitional federal government, which we support, is almost absolute. It is a, virtually a failed entity, uh, apart from Mogadishu, and only probably operating there with foreign intervention. And I have to say that the situation with this government, which we support, and our government supports, in terms of corruption, is absolutely appalling, and taxpayers here should know about it. A confidential audit of the Somali government suggests that in 2009 and 2010, 96%, 96% of direct assistance to the government from outside powers had simply disappeared, most likely into the hands of corrupt officials, and therefore billions Billions of pounds and dollars that have come from the West have simply disappeared. Now, I'm not attacking international aid, and I will say a moment before I sit down about the absolute vital importance of humanitarian aid, but it is appalling that 96%, apparently, according to a confidential and authoritative audit of our aid and other countries, has simply gone down the drain into the pockets of corrupt officials. So I believe that the transitional roadmap should be abandoned, if possible another roadmap agreed to, which is more flexible, able to develop in response to the reaction uh, to the implementation and bending the changes rather than be broken by them, which has happened in the past. I think a strict roadmap here, uh, as in many other parts of the world, is unlikely to succeed in practice. It's clear that the presidential system of a central administration is inappropriate for Somalia. It's proved to be unworkable. It might be wise to propose a confederal solution to the problem. The country could be arranged into a number of cantons, which then bestow authority upwards to the national government, rather than downwards from the centre, as in most unitary states. Yeah, I give way to my honourable um, friend. I actually rather agree with him about the, the federalist uh, uh, organization of the of the possible state which would reflect the, the sort of history of Somalia but can I just question him about this report that he says uh, saw so much w aid wasted this is rather counterintuitive since quite a high proportion of our aid as I said uh, actually goes to Somaliland which is relatively well governed and where these structures are, are, are well in place and quite a high proportion goes through NGOs where this kind of exercise of, of being siphoned off by officials shouldn't apply. So can he give a bit more detail about this report and its sources? I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not attacking aid to Somaliland. I'm talking about aid directly to the Somali government. I'm not talking about aid which goes to Somaliland or goes to NGOs. But there's undoubtedly a situation, uh, and I will happily send this report. I've got it. I'll happily send it to my honourable friend. Uh, it's very clear and very <laughs> explicit and authoritative. There's undoubtedly a failed state in Mogadishu, and I think we have to be aware of that and recognize it. Now, a report from the Council on Foreign Relations in New York suggests recognizing the reality on the ground by creating a council of leaders which could replace the bloated and ineffective TFG government and parliament. This would surely be a step in the right direction. Uh, I believe that if the political process begins to succeed in stabilizing Somalia, the issue of Somaliland, as we've said again and again in this debate, needs to be addressed. They've obviously, the Somalilanders, demonstrated their ability to function as an independent state. It's the only part of Somalia with a government that functions properly. It does so with some democratic legitimacy, and that's all the more commendable. All of Somalia, apart from Somaliland, is committed to the idea of a, a, uni a united state. For example, Puntland, while functioning separately, participates in the process of negotiations towards the creation of a recognisable national government and seeks to be in a state with Somalia. I believe that Somaliland, on the contrary, has quite decisively demonstrated its desire to add de jure sovereignty to its de facto independence, and they should be granted it. The FCO says self-determination is right for Falklanders, why is it not right for Somalilanders, in my view? So Somaliland should be given an offer, and this is one way forward, which I suggest, to sign up to a confederal Somalia with a guaranteed time frame, outlining an independence referendum within an agreed period of time, as was done with South Sudan, and nobody doubts what would be the result. 
of that referendum. Nobody doubts that if there was a fair uh, referendum in Somaliland, that it, they, they would vote for independence, which, as we've heard from our honourable friend for Banbury, they had in the past. This would give Somalilanders a realistic outlook <coughs> on achieving international recognition that the state currently lacks, while retaining the national legitimacy on a Somali-wide level, even if only transitionally. And it might be a way forward, and I just suggested as one idea for this conference, as others have done. Let me just say a bit about piracy. Uh, Puntland, where a lot of it comes from, is one of the, one of the poorest areas in an already poor country. Given the lucrative nature of piracy, its financial attraction is understandably strong. But it should also be noted that Somalia's fishing industry has collapsed in the past 15 years as its waters have been overfished, uh, not by local people, but by European, Asian and African ships from outside. And the lack of maritime security in Somalia coastal waters also provides a safe haven for people smuggling and arms smuggling in addition to illegal fishing. Now, we here in Britain, of course, suffer from our own common fisheries policy, a thoroughly counterproductive strategy that our own government is forced to accede to. But we should therefore sympathise with the position of those Somalis who are being ravaged by an immeasurably, <coughs> immeasurably worse depredation of their fishing stocks from outsiders. While the, whilst the pirates up to this point seem to be in it simply for their own financial enrichment, we must be aware of the potential convergence of terrorist groups in the area. And of course there's worse things that could happen. For instance, the sinking of a large container or tanker vessels in the approach to the Suez Canal where we propaganda coup for terrorists. Insurance premiums have already risen more than tenfold since the first flourishing of Somali piracy in 2008. And whilst pirates obviously keep the majority of the funds they obtain via ransoms, we can assume that a significant amount does provide local factions with an injection of cash that helps to finance warfare and escalate the level of conflict in the area. And I'm not going to repeat the points made by Honourable Friend for Croydon South, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Committee. But there is some confusion about exactly what ships can do <coughs> as pirates approach them. And we heard what my Honourable Friend for Croydon South said about this, that there must be a clear clarification of the law of the sea. And I'm sure the Minister, in winding up, can give, it, give us this. But actually, in a way, there's a lot of good progress. Operation Atalanta uh, is an impressive effort. It involves 23 of the 27 EU member states. Uh, we provide the operational headquarters at Northwood. Uh, there's also a combined task force, 150, a naval task force undertaken by a coalition under US coordination. It involves the UK, Canada, Denmark, France, Japan, Germany, participation from Australia, Italy, the Netherlands. It's all very uh, impressive and I think we should pay tribute <coughs> to it. But of course, all this shows just how important, and this is a point that I've got two honourable friends sitting in the chamber with me, who also took part in the debate on defence two weeks ago. It also shows the importance of our own Royal Navy and the work yeah. it does, yeah. and how it is increasingly yeah. overstretched. <coughs> in the Falklands, where we've had to send down a Type 45 destroyer, in the Straits of Hormuz, now with the anti-piracy <coughs> control, the fact is we cannot rely on others and there was a very authoritative report by our own defence committee and always underlines again and again that whilst in recent years people have said there's, there's not enough of the Royal Navy to do, actually it is an extraordinarily important part yeah. of uh, the national priority and it, should be, and it should be understood. Because of course we have allies, that's not doubt, we have allies for counter-terrorist and anti-piracy purposes. But perhaps we should remember Lord Palmerston's warning uh, that applies to us as to other people, that nations have no permanent allies, they only have permanent interests. We don't necessarily have permanent allies, we do have <coughs> permanent interests in terms of maintaining maritime security. And that's why I'm not going to leave, uh, I'm going to take every opportunity I can in these debates to pay tribute to what the Royal Navy does and its importance. And I hope that my honourable friends who are sitting around me when they succeed in catching or I, Mr Deputy Speaker, might also make uh, this point. <coughs> um, let me just end, if I may, on humanitarian uh, intervention. Uh, because I didn't want to, in my early remarks, try to uh, sound defeatist about the importance of international 
aid. And I do condemn the, the libertarian approach that says we should sit by and let the problem solve itself, while hundreds of thousands of people go hungry and die. I think this is completely counter to our history of humanitarianism. And therefore, I warmly commend what our honorable, right honorable friend, International Development Secretary, is doing and the help that he has given. And sometimes, although um, I often talk about the need for strict controls for public money, occasionally one has to cut through some treasury controls and one just has to get the aid out there. And I'd like to echo the concern expressed by a Chatham House paper that if the international community does only one thing, then ensuring the safe delivery of food aid should be the priority. So I have no argument by, about that. When 50 or 100,000 people are dying, then it's right that we should be prepared to take action. But so much of this uh, issue, and I'll end on this point with, um, with a quotation, if I may, so much of this um, so much is issue, the lack of interest, uh, the divided <coughs> councils, the lack of interest in many parts of the West. I mean, here we've got uh, perhaps up to 100,000 people have died in the last year, but this hasn't been an overwhelmingly uh, well-attended debate. The lack of interest, the divided councils, uh, the violence, um, none of this is new. I was. Uh, Reading this recently, it comes from Henry VI, Part One, Act One, from Shakespeare. Uh, Gloucester, is Paris lost? Is Rouen yielded up? Exeter, how were they lost? What treachery was used? Messenger, no treachery, but want of men and money. Among the soldiers, this is muttered that here you maintain several factions, and whilst a field should be dispatched and fought, you are disputing of your generals. One would have lingering wars with little cost. Another would fly swift, but wanteth wings. A third man thinks, without expense at all, by guileful fair words, peace may be obtained. Awake, awake, English nobility. Adrian Quote to follow the uh, honourable gentleman, but I do want to take up in other respects the last point that he was making in regard to the humanitarian assistance, in, indeed to the question of the uh, famine uh, in the whole of Africa, where of course Somalia was the worst uh, hit uh, country in, in most respects, because just as one could not deal with the uh, security issues without looking at, one could not deal with the famine without looking at the underlying security issues, equally the security issues also uh, in their resolution or in their approach at least uh, must take account of the famine and the circumstances of the alleged famine uh, in the Horn of uh, Africa. I want to make just a couple of points on that. Uh, it has been said time and time again that the famine in the Horn of Africa was both predictable and predicted. Uh, I'm sure members will have seen the excellent report recently produced by Save the Children Oxford, who concluded that there were many clear early warning signs many months in advance, yet there was insufficient response until it was far too late. And it was a failure to respond at many levels, international organisations, international agencies, countries, uh, throughout the world, countries in the region, and the UK government was actually one of the first, of course, to respond to the UK government's role was very positive. But together, the world community did, did not act in spite of repeated warnings, which many in this House will have read about and heard about uh, over the uh, last uh, year or so. And the question has to be then addressed, why was it that there was such a failure to act in time when there were such clear warnings? Obviously, there were a number of reasons, a number of features which uh, uh, had their role to play. There was certainly a lack of flexibility in systems in place to respond to the crisis. In Somalia in particular, weakness, of course, of the or non-existence of state organisations and the lack of security for NGOs and other actors. Uh, but the report from Oxfam and Save the Children also raises what I think is another very important feature, the fact that when that information from early warning systems is produced, there has to be action based upon the early warnings and that action has to take place at that point, not at the point when one is certain that there's going to be a crisis. If we wait till there's certainty, then the crisis will be well upon us and much more harder to deal with. That was, of course, a very difficult issue for both governments and NGOs to uh, deal with in their approach to crises. Resources for countries, for NGOs, are, of course, limited. Now, I can well foresee the criticism that they put in place 
that, that will be made if emergency supplies are put in place and then uh, uh, not fully utilised. But it does seem to me that the conclusion that if necessary, risk must be taken in terms of making early preparations uh, to avert such, such kind of famines. That is a conclusion which we must accept. And that's why the proposals in the recent uh, humanitarian emergency response review, the Ashton report, I think are very, uh, uh, very relevant. Uh, the recommendations there for stockpiles of supplies, the means to deliver them, that's something which clearly has to be considered and put in place for the future of policy in Somalia and elsewhere, and I'd be interested in knowing how the government will apply the conclusions of the Ashton report in its, uh, its approach to the conference in a couple of weeks' time. The next point I want to make is this, is that as we focus on Somalia, there were increasing warnings of another hunger crisis breaking out elsewhere in Africa in the uh, Sahel region. Now, of course, for Sahel, uh, this debate is about Somalia, but it's quite noticeable and quite concerning that many of the features which are uh, described as contributing to a potential crisis in the Sahel are very similar to ones we heard a couple of years ago about uh, uh, the crisis in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we're told there's late and poor uh, rain uh, in uh, 2011, food prices now getting too high for local uh, people to uh, afford at local markets, political instability arising uh, both from internal factors and from the knock-on effects of developments elsewhere in Africa. Very similar to the kind of things that were being said uh, in the Horn of Africa a couple of years ago. And certainly I'd be interested in knowing how the government will try and ensure the international community responds in advance of a crisis uh, in the Sahel. And that is something which is again related to the Somalia issue, because as we've seen from the famine of Horn of Africa, it can have a much wider destabilising effect than in the areas most widely affected. And given that we're also facing an increasingly worrying increase in tension in South Sudan and Sudan, we in the world community could well be faced with a massive area stretching from west to east Africa of hunger, disease and instability, and as well as the damage to countries and peoples directly affected, it will be bound to have effects on neighbouring countries, including ones which have recently been able to make substantial economic development and political progress. Now clearly, these are very to what the, what the UK can do. The UK has been a major provider of emergency aid under both this and the uh, previous uh, government. Uh, what we have to do, of course, is to get the world to mobilise and to try and get it to focus in a consistent way on some of these, uh, uh, these issues. The report from Save the Children Oxfam makes the point that one reason for the international community's lack of response to the crisis a developing crisis in the Horn of Africa may well have been other events such as the Arab Spring, the global recession, the Japanese earthquake, the tsunami. I'm sure that's right. But well, there's certainly as many, if not more, crises affecting the world now than as there were uh, two years ago. And there's got to be some way of trying to provide a continuing focus on the long term solutions uh, which uh, uh, are required to try and prevent these uh, crises developing uh, in the first place. In the time that I've got available, I haven't got time to develop the points I would have done if there had uh, been a few more minutes. But the kind of issues that we do need to look at is the kind of proposals, again outlined in the Save the Children for Not Sam report, the proposal for a charter to end extreme hunger, a charter which actually looks at longer term solutions to uh, uh, ensure, above all, that countries have the resilience so that when crises uh, natural disasters do happen, there is an ability to respond internally without needing to rely upon emergency assistance on uh, every uh, occasion. There's obviously got to be a need to resolve the security issue. And a final point, a final point that I would make there, given the time that I've got, is to, is, to, is, is to say this. The role of the African Union is, I think, in, in, uh, extremely important. It certainly should not be seen just as a proxy for uh, uh, richer countries, Western uh, powers, to be able to uh, get forces in there on the cheap. It should be something much more than that because at the end of the day it's going to have to be African countries, African leaders, African peoples and African organisations such as the African Union which are going to have to provide long-term support to deal with both immediate crises uh, of security and in other respects as well and I'd be interested in knowing from the Minister uh, uh, today what kind of further support we as the UK can give to the African Union both in, in its organisation as well as into specific missions, so that it can provide the kind of ability to respond to crises such as we're seeing in Horn of Africa, such as we may see elsewhere uh, in West Africa. Clearly, they're not being to provide a type of development assistance that can come from 
the uh, rich and more developed countries. But in terms of security support, technical support as well, and political support, their role can be important, should in my view become increasingly important, and I hope it will have the full support of the UK government as it tries to develop that role in the future. I'm really grateful for the, for the time constraint, Mr. Lazarevich. Sarah Newton. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think we are living in a time when you can actually feel the tectonic plates of geopolitics move. In and out of this chamber, this Parliament is quite rightly engaged in debates about our nation's role in the world. Demands on our armed services, working with allies in Afghanistan and in all countries around the world are increasing. Our diplomatic and humanitarian effort is being stretched even further. So with so much going on, it would be all too easy to forget Somalia, to think it less important than it really is. Well, I think it is essential to work with nations from around the world and to continue to provide support for Somalia. Many of my constituents ask me why. So fundamentally, I think it's because it matters to the security of the UK. There are over 350,000 Somalis living in the UK and we ignore this country's problems at our peril. We should heed the words of the Mayor of Mogadishu when he said to the BBC that disaffected young Somalis were leaving to train in the Al-Shabaab terror camps before returning to the UK with revenge in their hearts. In 2010, MI5 Director General Jonathan Evans warned us it was only a matter of time before terrorist trains in Somali camps inspired acts of violence on the streets of the UK. The points about the importance of keeping our shipping routes open and free from pirates, as well... Excuse, yes, I'll give one. What the Honourable Member was saying about the Somali community in Britain, and it, she's correct, there are at least 350,000, uh, but would she also, just for a moment, pause and reflect at the hard-working contributions that the community makes in terms of developing businesses and opportunities, the work they do, and the very positive role that a lot of young Somalis play within their community, within the education system, and not allow a message to go out that somehow or other denigration of an entire community of very ambitious and very hard-working young people. Uh, I, I really don't believe the point that I was making in at all reflected in a negative way on the vast majority of Somalis that live in our country and make a very positive contribution. That point has been made very well by members this afternoon and I completely concur with that point. But we also must not put our head in the sand and not listen to professionals that are accountable to this Parliament in the professional advice that they're giving to us. So I very much welcome um, what the government is doing um, to re-establish an embassy in Somalia and the effort of the UN to re-establish its um, uh, base in Mogadishu. So Mr Deputy Speaker, I very much hope in the weeks around the forthcoming major conference hosted by the, Prim by the Prim Prime Minister on Somalia, that our media will play their part in helping people <coughs> up and down this country, especially parts of the world like where I represent, where we don't have the day-to-day -day contact with the Somali um, community, to really understand why it is important that they support and Britain supports our continued involvement in Somalia. Because while we're all here today, we clearly understand, all parties here understand, a very large percentage of the people who have sent us here don't really understand and do have reservations why we are continuing this support. And I think it's quite understandable. People are often very susceptible to compassion fatigue, especially when their standard of living is being squeezed and people are losing their jobs. Many fear good money is being wasted. With so many conflicts erupting around the world, they might tire of even trying to keep up with what's going on. As taxpayers' money is being spent, I think it's vital that we all do our bit to make the case for support. I do think that people will want to support our efforts in Somalia if they understand the risks to our own national security and they believe we are really making a positive difference on the ground. So today I want to share with colleagues the positive difference that humanitarian aid is making to thousands of people in Somalia, who we not, must not forget are amongst the poorest and most long-suffering people on the planet. 
Now, I've mentioned Shelterbox, a great Cornish emergency and humanitarian aid charity in this house before. Not only do they provide boxes that contain shelter, basic cooking equipment, water sanitisation and tools, but their ingenuity to respond to different situations has enabled them to deliver what I think is a remarkable array of services in Somalia from their sturdy boxes. Boxes all packed and distributed from Cornwall, enabled by donations and volunteers. Now, over the past few years, several thousand boxes have been sent to Somalia, and a further nearly 500 boxes, including 50 classroom boxes, are currently en route. This shipment of direct aid is enough to provide shelter for about a thousand families. Now, due to the security risks of working in the country at the moment, they don't actually have any volunteers on the ground in Somalia. They are instead working with a partner agency, a French medical charity, um, Women's Health Alliance International, who have a long history of working in Somalia. Now, at the main um, displacement camp in Mogadishu, they've already set up a health centre where there is a hospitalisation facility using the disaster relief, uh, relief tents donated by Shelterbox, which is providing primary health care consultation rooms, a delivery suite and even a small hospital. Um, the Shelterbox tents not only provide a clean, sterile area for the medical staff to work in, but also allow patients to be hospitalised by staying with their families rather than being separated. Pregnant women also have privacy while they're having their antenatal consultations and giving birth. And this has been described, described by the doctors on the ground as having made a dramatic difference to the well-being of hundreds of Somali families in dire need of assistance in Mogadishu. Now, Shelterbox's success in helping people in Somalia is a result of having worked around the world for many years, building effective working relationships with local organisations, organisations without the bureaucracy and inefficiency of some of the multinational agencies. Wherever they work in the world, they work with locals, and in doing so, try and build capacity within those nations to deal with future disasters. Mr Deputy Speaker, working in partnership with other countries' aid efforts and working with people in the countries we are supporting to develop their own capacity, I believe is quite rightly at the heart of the government's humanitarian aid response. This theme was echoed in a recent report published by Oxfam that said the UN and international NGOs provide only part of the answer to the crises from Haiti to the Horn of Africa. So finally, when the Minister comes to respond to this debate today, I would appreciate his reassurance that the gov Government's admirable plans to publish information on how taxpayers' money is spent in Somalia will be implemented for all to see. Just as donors to Shelterbox can go online and see how their money is being spent so well, I think this would go some way to reassuring my constituents that their money is being well spent and as a result will public support for the essential work that Britain needs to continue to do in Somalia. Thank you for your time. I'm grateful to, the, have, to have the opportunity to speak in this important de debate today and first would like to add my congratulations to the Foreign Secretary and his team for their leadership on this issue. And it is indeed excellent that he could visit Somalia firsthand to learn and to see the challenges today in rebuilding Somalia. I'd like to echo the Secretary of State's words last week that for the security of the UK, it matters a lot for Somalia to become a more stable place. And I'm indeed pleased that the UK is hosting the Somalia conference. I would like to just make a few brief comments uh, on this debate from the point of view also of my constituency, Felton and Heston, which has a small but significant Somalian population. My experience has been of a hard-working community looking to develop a life for their families, parents encouraging their children to do well at school and have the chance to take up education that was denied to so many, and many also making a positive contribution to the local community through voluntary and other work. The leaders of the Dar es Salaam Masjid and C Cultural Centre in Heston have also shown a lead in helping fellow Somalians who have settled here to deal with the consequences that have come from them and their families experiencing two decades of conflict and famine. 
In this, I'd also like to build on comments by my honourable friend for Bethnal Green and Bow about the aspiration of so many in the Somalian community, the other side of the story of Somalia, that the conference in two weeks' time has an opportunity to highlight and to keep centre stage as a symbol of hope. My short contribution today relates to three areas, the engagement of the Somalian diaspora, the situation of Somaliland, and one of the themes of the conference around developing systems and livelihoods. Firstly, on the engagement of the Somalian diaspora, I just want to pick up on helpful comments from the Secretary of State on the event at Chatham House, which other members of this House have also referred to, as part of the pledge that members of the civil society and Somalian diaspora have the opportunity to contribute positively to the conference outcomes. I wonder if the Minister in his wind-up speech may be able to make more reference to this and whether members of the Somalian diaspora here, including from my constituency, will be engaged in any future activity. The conference will indeed be the start of a new phase of work and its legacy ongoing um, is important and it would be a lost opportunity indeed to not build after the conference on some of the relationships and engagement that have developed in the run-up to it. I will give way. Extremely grateful to the Honourable Lady who is making a very powerful case for the diaspora community in her constituency. As in mine, I have a diaspora community in Swindon, and I'd like to reinforce the point that she makes to the Minister about the need for the mechanisms of engagement to be made clear so that uh, my constituents, like hers, can make a positive contribution to issues such as the future of Somali land. I thank the Honourable Member for that, and I totally support uh, his comment. I will give way. On that point, I, I, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Um, when those mechanisms are established, can, can we be quite clear that we want to engage men and women from the community? Because uh, too often when we talk about community engagement, we don't always mean men and women equally. Thank you. And if uh, my, uh, the Honourable Member will probably be aware of my uh, commitment to the engagement of women in all aspects of political and public life, and I would totally concur yeah, yeah. with her comments. On the engagement of Somaliland, so, sorry, on the situation of Somaliland, I simply want to add to comments already made uh, so eloquently by members uh, of this House on both sides, with Somaliland represented um, in its own right at this conference. And just a request that the government continue to acknowledge the separate and successful development achieved by Somalilanders by turning Somaliland into a beacon of democracy in Africa. There is a fear among Somalilanders that Somaliland could be dragged into the quagmire of the South Central region. What we want is a secure and democratic South and continuation of a secure and democratic Somaliland so that together Somalians can decide on their own future. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, in my closing comment, to ask if the Minister may highlight more about one of the themes of the conference around developing systems and livelihoods and I'd like to extend this to the comments powerfully made on economic development by honourable members for Cheltenham and Leicester South. To what extent is access to education and jobs part of the agenda at conference? And how can we help develop an environment where young Somali men also, who may be more vulnerable otherwise and drawn into terrorism activity, have an alternative and a new hope for themselves and for their families, because to be able to create an alternative life for the next generation to live peacefully would surely be a tremendous legacy from this conference that we would all be proud of. I am grateful to the House for the opportunity to make this contribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, Mr. Speaker, can I thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity to participate in this debate? And I am not going to pretend for one moment that I am a great uh, person who knows an enormous amount about. Um, Somalia. My nearest, I have to say, is probably being a member of the Addis Ababa Division of the Barmy Army as we flew down to South Africa and watched some cricket. Uh, that's the nearest where I've been to it. And I can say that waking up at six o'clock in the morning to, sound, to hear the sound of the imam may certainly gave an enormous amount of cultural feeling to the whole place. 
Now, I am, I am very much of the opinion that a lot of the legacies which we are going through at the moment, especially to do with Somalia, are very much the legacies of the Cold War. Uh, and that is that as and when the Cold War came to an end, it was obviously very, very clear that there were no longer two superpowers which were being able to argue the case. And so, therefore, places like Somalia, I suspect, ended up by falling through the cracks a bit. And indeed, if this chamber were in a position to be able to talk, these walls, I have no doubt, would be telling us that during the course of the last 175 years ago, uh, that in fact these similar kind of debates were taking place, because as you may remember, uh, after, the, um, after the Napoleonic Wars, there was an enormous sense that uh, there was a great deal of, of piracy which took place both in North Africa uh, and also in the, uh, in the Mediterranean as well. Now, in 2008, nearly a million, uh, million dollars of trade travelled from the EU to, for, sorry, to the EU through the, uh, through the Gulf of Avon. And so the UK mm. has a very keen interest in making sure that we are supporting and looking after our maritime position in the world. It is a very important, therefore, that my honourable my right honourable friends are playing the kind of part which they are in leading in this great debate as well. Our shipping industry is worth around about £10.7 billion in the way of UK uh, GDP. And I am told that piracy could be costing as much as £12 billion a year. Now, surprise, surprise, I'm going to be speaking for the Navy in a moment or two, uh, and you would imagine that as the Member of Parliament for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport, what I would claim, though others might uh, disagree with me, to be one of the very major homes uh, for the Royal Navy. Um, now, 23,000 ships go through the Gulf of Eden each year, and I think this is a very good example of why import how important it is that we as a nation do not end up becoming sea blind. I am reminded of the story of a ship that went into Sierra Leone, which went into the port, uh, then went out again, uh, and actually for the next uh, six, nine months, the people who were living in Sierra Leone, the terrorists and the people who wanted to create lots of trouble, were actually absolutely convinced that if they actually started misbehaving, that frigate would be straight back into that port and making sure that they didn't actually have uh, an opportunity in which to create trouble again. And can you imagine, therefore, what it would be like in this country if we no longer had any petrol, if we no longer had any groceries in our, in our food stores and things like that. So that is the reason why I believe that the Royal Navy has a very significant part to play. And that's the reason why I want to make sure that in my talk um, that Somalia is seen as an international issue which we're looking after. Now, last year, uh, last summer, I came back with one of the... Um, um, type 23s coming back from, um, from Malta to, uh, to Majorca, uh, and where I had an opportunity to talk and see as to how it was the crew operated. They had just literally come back off um, duty uh, dealing with piracy issues just off um, uh, the coast of Somalia as well. And it was very interesting. The first thing which I learned was that all uh, naval ships now have on board a legal officer to make sure that any decisions which are going to be taken are going to be ones which are actually going to be compliant with international law. That may certainly be a very different story from the days of Captain Bly, I suppose, <laughs> sailing around the South Pacific, because he may certainly wouldn't have worried too much about that. But it does actually move as to show as to how much we have ended up by, by moving on. And I also would like to say that the other key issue as well which came up uh, during the course of it was their real concern that as with their Royal Marines were unable to go onto the land in order to try and take out some of those terrorist and piracy camps. And I very much hope that when uh, my honourable friends uh, end up by having a conversation uh, with the Somali conference, which I very much welcome, that that is going to be an issue which is most certainly going to be looked at. But it's got to be done very firmly on a United Nations basis where a lot of people are around. Yes. I thank my right, honourable friend. I'm spurred to action by his comments about Royal Marines going ashore. I personally think, as part of our initiative, we should actually consider and plan to put anti-piracy headquarters into Somalia, perhaps into Mogadishu that's protected by Royal Marines, and then get a grip of the piracy along the littoral coast. That's the only way we could do it, because at the moment we're fiddling around in the large ocean. We want to get a base on shore and sort it out. And that should be part of the London Conference, if it's possible. 
Can I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. And yes, in the main, I, I think that I agree with him. But I would just have to say that I think it is very important if we are going to do that kind of stuff, we have to take with us those people who are in a position to actually make that decision, although there would be nothing worse, would there, than us actually putting uh, our troops uh, onto the ground only to find ourselves in a similar kind of position as has happened in places like Iraq and places like that where we have not been welcomed uh, particularly. Now, I would very much like to pay tribute to the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines based in my constituency, and especially HMS Cornwall and HMS Chatham, both of which were port-based. They were Type 22s, which unfortunately now have had to go, uh, but they did an enormously good job, and I have to say I was incredibly impressed when I had this uh, great opportunity to come up uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, as I say, last year. The other big key issue which a lot of people spoke to me about was how concerned they are that they don't have an opportunity of earning a medal in the same way as those people who have been doing uh, business in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And I would urge my honourable friend to take that on board because I do think that they are making a very significant contribution of protecting our trade routes in this country uh, as well. And then the other point which I just finally would like to make, if we are going to be in the business of nation building, which is what I think potentially we should be about, we have got to be helping to give advice to those potential new leaders who are coming forward. And I think we might actually use our universities to set up a number of opportunities for would-be leaders of the future to come to our university to learn about international relations, but more importantly, how you create those structures of governance, like judiciary, like, uh, like the uh, policing, governance, all of those kind of things, because I think that that would be a very effective way of us exporting our knowledge. And a surprise, surprise, we as a country have a proud, in my opinion, uh, reputation for our empire, and we made sure that we actually have the structures which are still in place in many of those countries as well. And the final point which I would make is that Somaliland, uh, as we all know, uh, used to be a British dependency at one stage, and in seeking to try and work with Somaliland, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could make sure that in this the year of the d Jubilee, the Queen's Jubilee, if they could actually be encouraged to come back into our Commonwealth and therefore continue that very great relationship which we have with that country already. Thank you. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm very pleased that we are having this debate on Somalia and I think it's the first debate for a very, very long time, if ever, on the floor of the House on the, the issue of Somalia. There's been adjournment debates in the past, but this is a major step forward and I absolutely welcome it. There is a clear need for peace, there is a clear need for reconciliation, there is a clear need for social justice, and I hope that the London Conference helps to provide that. And as I said on my intervention to the Foreign Secretary, I hope that uh, we won't have lots of international conferences all over the world, we'll instead be witnessing, observing and hearing reports of um, proper open political dialogue in Somalia by all sections of the community there, which would indicate a development of uh, a democratic free society, which is what we want. Um, I represent uh, Islington North, and that includes the Finsbury Park area, where there's a very large number of um, Somali people have made their homes. And it's a very strong, very vibrant community, very hard-working community, and very ambitious groups of young people trying to achieve. And so my intervention on a member for Falmouth was not intended to be critical of the points she was making. It was intending to make sure that we get the message out that there's a very big Somali community in Britain that is making a great contribution to our society. And they're young people, just like young people anywhere else, who want to achieve the best in life. And we should support them and applaud what they do, rather than allow a whole community to be denigrated, which some of the media, unfortunately, have done towards Somali people over a considerable time. This morning, I chaired a 
very large meeting at the Finsbury Park Mosque, in which I'm delighted to say the Minister of State, who's going to reply to the debate later on, attended as the guest speaker. We had over 70 people present at that meeting. Many, many questions were raised, many issues were raised concerning the conference, what will happen with the conference, how things will develop from there, and also questions about support and recognition for the community in Britain. And I say thank you very much to the Minister for being prepared to come along this morning. It was much appreciated by the mosque and by the community that we had that open dialogue and debate. And I hope that open dialogue and debate can be held in other communities as well, because the point that all of us made this morning was that that there is a very big diaspora community, there is a lot of interlinking inter between the communities in Britain and in Somalia, a lot of money is sent home, but also people go back and forth in order to exercise their skills and their wish to see uh, development of their own society, and I think that's something that we should see as an asset and a contribution for the future. And also, the local community, in, in my case, raised a great deal of money for famine support. And interestingly, the um, famine uh, concert that we held, an evening concert that we held, was organised by One True Voice, a Somali women's organisation. And the event was held in a Catholic church to emphasise their participation in the local community. And I think that's something that we should all applaud. We are dealing with the consequences of a... Um, colonial past of the Cold War, we're dealing with the consequences of the history of Africa in many ways. All those straight lines on maps that uh, drew boundaries between countries that were utterly meaningless towards the communities. Except in Somalia it's slightly different because it is the only country in Africa that is linguistically unified. It's the only country in Africa where there is only one language spoken. Every other country in Africa has a whole multiplicity of languages, but I'm about to be corrected by many members opposite who uh, obviously wish <laughs> to correct me but will will can that can they just hold themselves if they want to get to speak and I'll be brief as well um, safer world have sent a very interesting brief for this debate today in which the, let's say one of the few countries in Africa okay um, safer world have sent a very interesting um, briefing for this debate today and I just quote from it and it says it will only be through addressing the factors that underline Somalia's conflict that the country will ever move from repeated crises towards lasting peace and prosperity. And in that, they outline a whole lot of issues surrounding um, instability, lack of political cohesion, corruption, power of warlords, fear of, ma of many people, and of course the ready supply of arms and guns and the inability of any effective civil society in much of the country, not all of it, much of the country, to do anything about it. I've also received a very interesting briefing from the National Union of Journalists and indeed I tabled EDM 2638 on this issue concerning the killing of journalists, uh, the latest of whom was um, Abdul Hassan Sheikh Hassan who was shot dead on the 18th of December 2011 and I also listed a number of other journalists that were killed during 2011. There is a report from the Somali Union of Journalists, Lives and Rights of Journalists Under Threat. And it goes through in gruesome detail the numbers of journalists that have been killed for trying to report what was going on. The number that have been harassed by um, officialdom in all parts of Somalia for trying to report the unreportable or those that things they did not wish to be reported. We want to know what's going on in Somalia, so I do hope that in the um, outcome of the conference the Minister will be able to assure us that there will indeed be a reference to the right to know and protection for those that are reporting because if authorities of any sort, and I'm talking here of illicit authorities as well as legitimate authorities, kill journalists, they do it for a reason. They don't want the news to get out and I just think we have to uh, recognise that and be as supportive as we can of them. The, the issues of children's rights and uh, child soldiers was raised by uh, somebody else in the debate, remember, um, who spoke earlier, and um, the recommendations from Amnesty International are very, I think, very important, saying that the, uh, all elements should uh, verify that children are not among the um, transitional government forces, that no person under 18 is recruited into any forces, and that the demobilisation and reintegration of child soldiers into their ranks is very important. This isn't some esoteric liberal argument that's being pursued from afar. 
What I'm saying is that if you don't do something, if we don't do something or encourage something to be done about the use of child soldiers and the brutalization of children in this conflict, post-conflict, they grow up into adults that know nothing other than the use of a gun, the use of force, and the use of assertion of force in order to get their way. And you then end up with all the horrors of a gang culture and a criminal culture such as one has experienced in post-conflict societies such as Guatemala and El Salvador and indeed in parts of South Africa after the end of apartheid. And so it's in everybody's interests to ensure that the rights of children are respected. And I do absolutely endorse the point made an intervention earlier that the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child should be signed and recognised by, um, by the Congress, and I hope it is. And I just conclude with this thought, that um, this conference is being held in the former colonial capital. It is a whole great European tradition. There are some awful European traditions, one of which was the Congress of Berlin in 1884 that decided most of the borders of Africa. And I hope this is the last time this kind of thing happens. I want to see progress in Somalia. I want to see a development of an open and democratic society. And also recognition of the poverty of many people there, of the death rate from wholly preventable conditions and illnesses, and the way in which a great deal of aid simply doesn't get to the people it should get to because gangs get hold of it, corrupt officials get hold of it, or somebody else gets hold of it, and no benefit derives from it whatsoever. And in the briefing that um, has, has come, and the, and the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs published its uh, estimate of the situation. This is a couple of months old, but I suspect the situation isn't that difficult, in which, to echo what the Foreign Secretary was saying earlier, 4 million people, 53% of the Somali population, are in crisis countrywide based on the food, uh, food supply figures. And um, of the 4 million, 3 million of those are in the southern region of Somalia, which is an increase on what happened from last summer. And 750,000 are seriously in famine, and the famine has been extended. Yes, we have to provide food aid. Yes, we have to provide support for those people that are suffering. But I do say, let's recognize that the situation has got very, very bad in Somalia. The rest of the world has finally woken up to it, woken up to the need for aid, woken up for the need for recognition. And fortunately, so far in this debate and all the other debates I've heard, people aren't talking about Iraq or Afghanistan type Western military interventions. They're talking about supporting a process which brings about political change, recognition and development and respect for all the different traditions that are there in Somalia. I'm proud to represent a very large Somali community in Britain. Britain. It breaks my heart when I hear of their relatives stuck in refugee camps for years on end, or people being killed on the streets of Mogadishu and they can't go home to uh, attend the funeral and things like that. That is not the future that those people want for Somalia. They want a future which is based on political recognition, which is based on democratic institutions, and is based on an understanding that uh, we have to, a responsibility to do our very best to help the end of this crisis and help those people realize the dreams that all of us want, a long life, fulfillment for our children, and, um, and a fair and secure society. That surely is what the aim of this conference ought to be about. Jane Ellis, I think is incredibly important. I'll give way. I'm very grateful to my honorable friend, because our honorable friend for Cheltenham asked me the source for the statistic of 96% of direct bilateral aid to TFG going astray. And I'm sorry I didn't have it right next to me, but it's important to put it on the record. It comes from the investigative report by the Transitional Federal Government's own Public Finance Management Unit, PF, PFMU, for 2009-10. Their own internal report shows that 96% of the bilateral aid going to them is going into the hands, probably, of corrupt officials. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful to my honourable friend, the man for Gainsborough. I would point out that we have never given aid directly to the TFG, but of course a lot of aid has gone into Mogadishu, and that's why it's incredibly important we now have a new financial management board. A, a number of honourable colleagues, uh, the honourable member for Leicester South, uh, the honourable member for Islington North, and my honourable friend for Battersea, mentioned a point about, about women and, and, and children in particular, and the role of the TFG in making sure 
and these issues are addressed. And we'll certainly look at language and the communique around that. And I certainly agree with Honourable Member for Plymouth Sutton and Devonport. It is essential that going forward post transition, we build more capacity and more administrative ability within the structures uh, of the administration and government in Mogadishu. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about Somaliland because uh, the Honourable Member for, for Cardiff South and Panaf and my Honourable Member for Banbury spoke very eloquently about Somaliland. Indeed, my Honourable Friend for Banbury gave a, a brilliant uh, history lesson to us all. He told us about his visit to Hargeza a few years back when the red carpet was rolled out and there were crowds 20 deep in the streets going into Hargeza. Uh, I visited Hargeza myself uh, last July. I, I was met by the President at the airport. I did uh, uh, receive a red carpet, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, but I fear to say that the, the crowds were certainly not 10 deep on the drive into uh, the, the city centre. Uh, but I'm very grateful to him and for the Honourable Member for Cardiff South and Panar for their knowledge because it is an important conference uh, for President Solania. He has been invited to take part and we, we feel very strongly that this is a conference which the Somali landers can contribute to. They can tell the, the rest of Somalia what they've done to build stability, what has worked in terms of free and fair elections uh, and why they are a very good development partner for the, the UK. And so his decision, I think, is a brave one, and it's the right decision. And obviously, I do believe, uh, my honourable friend asked me, that will Somaliland's uh, position be enhanced by attending? I believe it will. He, he will have a chance to speak. He, he won't be talking about Somaliland independence. He'll be talking about what Somaliland can do to enhance the whole process, the peace process in Somalia, uh, and what's happening on his doorstep. And I believe that by coming on to the international stage, he, he'll be able to meet a, a large number of international statesmen and heads of state, and, and he'll be able to explain to them exactly what uh, he has done, what has worked in Somaliland, and why, that, uh, why Somaliland has been so successful. And, and I certainly take on board what the Right Honourable Men Member mentioned about the Somaliland Development Corporation and the role of the private sector. But in the meantime, with uh, Somaliland, particularly in terms of the agreement between the Seychelles to allow convicted pirates in the Seychelles to return to Somaliland to serve their sentences. And obviously we are urging President Solano to pass its draft piracy law and prisoner transfer law, both essential to allow the prisoner transfer back to Somalia. We are uh, urging him to do that in time for the conference. Now, of course I give way. It may seem a very minor point, but he referred to them returning to Somaliland. I think, by and large, uh, the uh, pirates are not from Somaliland, so it would be coming to Somaliland to ser serve their, uh, their, their sentences uh, as part of the assistance that Somaliland is giving to the international community. Well, it's a very good point, that, because obviously some of the pirates may well uh, originate from tribes from uh, Somaliland. Others will be from tribes in, uh, in Puntland and uh, maybe in d indeed further south. But I think it's a sign of Somaliland's commitment to solving the scourge of piracy that they are prepared to enter into this uh, MOU, which is incredibly important. Mr Deputy Speaker, a number of uh, uh, right honourable and honourable members have mentioned Amazon. And I'd pay tribute to those brave and courageous young Ugandans and Burundians who have put their lives on the line to secure uh, the space in Mogadishu for the TFG to move in and hopefully provide services and better services in the future. Uh, and we have been supporting Amazon, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. We are the biggest contributor to the Amazon Trust Fund on a non-caveated basis. And I'm very uh, pleased to be able to tell the Honourable Member for Beckenham that Amazon is looking at its command and control configuration and it's now looking at sector sub-commands. And I'd also say to him that it is a, a peace enforcement mission and it is doing various things that I don't believe a normal UN peacekeeping mission would be able to do because these are brave troops from those countries who really have uh, worked incredibly hard. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's no substitute to actually building up the capacity of the Somali national forces, the TFG forces, because obviously, as far as Amazon is concerned, this is a short-term solution, but we need to build capacity of the Somali police and national forces. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Right Honourable Member for Paisley and Renfrew South mentioned uh, the scale of the threat from al-Shabaab and what we're going to do about it. Well, I can tell him that we want to galvanise the international community to support the countries in the region to improve their capacity to investigate and disrupt the immediate terrorist threat. Mr Deputy Speaker, on piracy, 
Uh, a number of honourable members have uh, raised this, including the honourable member for Croydon South, uh, the honourable member obviously for Plymouth Sutton and Devonport, and the honourable, my honourable friend, the member for Portsmouth North. And I'd like to uh, congratulate them on the work they've done in their constituencies and supporting the Royal Navy. Uh, and certainly, my honourable friend, the chairman of the Backbench Committee, will be replying to his report in detail in the near future. But I can tell him that as far as those specific questions are concerned, uh, he asked whether the private armed security guards will be licensed. Yes, companies need to apply to the Home Office for a Section 5 licence in advance of deploying to a high-risk area. So far, five companies have applied for licences. As far as the rules of engagement are concerned, the Department for Transport have provided guidance already to industry on the use of force. Negotiations with the Home Office are ongoing. And so I think we are moving, hopefully, into the right place in terms of this particular policy, which has been widely welcomed. I think the coordination of the international navies has been excellent, and in, but obviously piracy has to be solved on the land. We're dealing with the, the, the problem at sea because we have to. But what we need to do, if we can build political progress in Somalia, particularly in Portland, in Galmaduk, and in the south, then we'll be able to solve the problem on the land. And one of the things I'm really keen to do is, is to make sure that where those communities chase out the pirates, then development aid from the donor community, from the private sector, goes into those communities to build new fish markets, for example, to build new schools and, and, and new medical centres. But in the meantime, we're trying to get MOUs in place so that those uh, pirates who are detained can be taken for trial in the region and then they can be taken for imprisonment to serve their prison terms in Somaliland itself. So we're working on MOUs with the Seychelles, with Mauritius, with Kenya, where there is already an MOU, we want to get it reactivated, and we're working also on Tanzania and Mozambique. And so I would say that while we can't be complacent, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are making progress. Now, on the humanitarian front, uh, I would certainly underline the fact that DFID have done a quite superb job. But we must now move from aid to development. And I certainly agree with the Honourable Member for, for Leicester South and also my Honourable Friend, the Member for Cheltenham, who both pointed out that the way forward obviously is through development. And it's incredibly important that we bear in mind that the, the Somalis themselves are entrepreneurs, they're business people. And the DFID uh, emphasis now on the private sector is very relevant to Somalia. Uh, and if you combine that with the remittances going back into Somalia, which my right friend the Foreign Secretary pointed out was uh, roughly one billion US dollars, then I think we're going to have a much more promising situation for those young people in Somalia, because rather than looking to extremism, to possibly to terrorism, they can look to businesses and to, and to helping Somali be rebuilt through the private sector, through entrepreneurial drive and through enterprise and through initiative, which obviously is a point that uh, my honourable friend member Fanit South uh, uh, made herself. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, what, what uh, my honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, said is that we're, we're determined to have a more reinvigorated focused international approach to Somalia. And we feel the time is absolutely right to do that. Uh, and, but the international community, it, it has been working uh, on Somalia over years. But what there's been a lack of is a really coordinated approach. I've been to a number of international contact group meetings on Somalia. And whilst a great deal of positive things have been spoken about, we haven't had those work groups or those work streams being really well developed also, with the UN being brought in with uh, really serious expertise and the AU and the, and the EU. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do think that momentum really has built up towards this conference. The, the, my run friend and myself, we are very encouraged by the number of countries that have accepted to come. So it's not going to be a one-off. We actually want this to really kick-start a much more reinvigorated and imaginative international approach. There is a very important role for the diaspora. We've had this outreach with the diaspora. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think Somalia is at a crossroads. There's no shortage of goodwill, but ultimately it's up to the Somali people themselves to rebuild their country. The question is that this House has considered the matter of how to build a stable and peaceful Somalia. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to motion number two, business of the House, the 22nd of February. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.
We now come to motion number three, business of the House motion, 23rd of February. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye, aye. or the contrary no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. I beg to move this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Make Hillier. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy.